the verse I have before you, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You must understand, millions of people Millions of people in the religious world. Now, I know, I know Donald Trump can see 200 and say millions. I'm talking millions of people all over the world believe that this verse right here teaches the moment you believe in Jesus, you're saved. No further action is required. You just believe in Jesus, trust in Him as your Savior, you're saved at that moment, and then some teach once you're saved, you can never do anything to be lost. So once you've come to this point, take it to heaven. Is that really what this says? To understand this passage, we have to look at the context, as with any passage. This morning we looked at the first eight verses. Now I would like for us to look at the verses that follow this particular passage. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 9. Notice what he said in the next verse. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. All right, let's think about that. That's the verse that immediately comes after Romans 10, 9, that everybody says teachers are saved by faith only. Notice the phrase in verse 10, unto righteousness. And the phrase, the last two words, unto salvation. This is from the Greek word in English, it's E-I-S, and it means unto. It means looking forward to something. It's the same word that's used in Acts 2.38 when Peter said, Repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of sins. Unto the remission of sins. With the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. He doesn't say righteousness and salvation immediately comes at the point of faith. No verse in the Bible says that. Justification does not come by the law of Moses. The law of Moses is found in the first five books of your Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And it is based upon the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. That law was given to the Israelite people for a limited period of time and was never intended to be a justifying principle. It was a part of God's scheme to take that part out of God's scheme and separate it from all the rest of God's scheme is what is done in the religious world. Justification does not come by the law of Moses, but rather by the new order of faith. 
in the New Testament it's called the faith. Jude 3. It's called the gospel. Justification does not come by the law of Moses. It comes by this new order. This new order of faith. The faith. The gospel. That's how justification comes to man. Not by the Old Testament law of Moses. Jesus brought this new system. And often in the New Testament is just referred to as faith or belief. And all the components are not given every time. Sometimes it's simply referred to as belief or faith. Repentance isn't mentioned every time. That doesn't mean you don't have to repent. This new system is often simply referred to as faith or belief in the Bible. In the New Testament, that's how it's often referred to. Look at John 17. Here he's talking about the first five books of the Bible that we refer to as the law of Moses, the law of God's people under the Old Testament. John 1, 17, For the law came by Moses. Moses was a great lawgiver. You remember he went up on Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments. And then after he received those Ten Commandments, he was given elaboration of those Ten Commandments that are found in the first five books of the Bible. The law came by Moses. John 1.17, he was a great lawgiver. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And remember Jesus said in John 8.32, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's free from your sins. The law of Moses can't do that. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God's new order, His new system can set us apart from this world. It can set us free from sin. And it is contrasted with the old system, the Mosaic Law. Now you see, that's the context of Romans 10.9. If you don't understand that, you can't understand that verse. What's he saying in Romans 10.9? We are not justified by the Mosaic Law. Now we are saved by this new system that he calls belief or faith. Could be translated either way, same word. So if you understand the contrast that's being made, you can understand Romans 10.9. But just to take Romans 10.9 out of this setting and say this is what it teaches, I don't know how many little tracks I've picked up that just write out Romans 10, 9 and say this is God's plan of salvation. Right out of its setting, right out of its context and say this is the way God saves people. Millions of people believe that. You have to note the contrast. In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, that we looked at this morning, there's a contrast being made. What is the contrast? 
between the Mosaic Law and the new order that has been brought about by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The Israelite people, for the most part, in verse 1 through 3, Romans 10, they believed they could be justified by the old Mosaic law. They were zealous about it. Paul said they hadn't submitted to God's way of being right. So he says they're not right with God. He's contrasting the old system with the new. The old system was never intended to bring justification. The Mosaic Law was never intended to justify people from their sins. Romans 3.20 by the law is the knowledge of sin. I would dare say before, well I'd say at least most of you ladies tonight before you came, you stood in front of a mirror. Now what did you do that for? What did you stand in front of a piece of glass before you come up here? Well that mirror reflects your image. And it shows you the imperfections. Here's a little spot here. Here's a little line here. Here's a little thing up here. And, and, we, and we take all this war paint and we fix it. We fix it. This hair's out of place. You, you, you pat it down. Unless you got like mine in the back, you can't pat it down. I, I, I mean, you could take a steamroller. It ain't going down. But you try. You try to fix those. That's what the law is. It shows you your imperfections. It can't fix them. The Mosaic Law can't fix them. It shows you you're imperfect before God. Shows you don't deserve His grace and His mercy. But just seeing that in the mirror, that doesn't fix it. You got to put on the war paint. You got to put on the Mary Kay or whatever to fix it. That mirror doesn't fix it. The law doesn't fix our imperfections. The law of Moses just showed you. You messed up. You are a messed up puppy. That's all it's showing you. He can't fix it. But these people, they tried to be justified by the works of the law. Paul's saying it can't be done. Christ's new order, think about this, it's confirmed with the blood of Christ. Matthew 26, 28. When He instituted this Lord's Supper, He says, this is My blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, under the Mosaic Law, you didn't have the blood of Christ. You had the blood of animals. Do you think those animals volunteered to go up to the altar? Do you think they went out to the pens and say, all right, who wants to volunteer first? And a little lamb walks up. No, it wasn't voluntary. Under the law of Christ, the sacrifice is greater. It's not some involuntary animal that had no choice. It's God's own Son who willingly gave Himself to take away my sins. That's the superiority of the system. Well, did God make both systems? Yes. But He never made the first system to justify us. He made the first system to show us how much we need the second one. And to take the first one and try to be justified by it, 
Paul contrasted the two systems in the first few verses of chapter 10. Now look at verse 11, Romans 10 verse 11. For the Scripture says, the Scripture says, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Now that means in the original language, be put to shame. Whosoever believeth in Christ will not be put to shame. Whosoever is a child of God under this new system, he'll never be put to shame. It says the Scripture saith. Well, where does the Scripture say it? Isaiah 28, verse 6. He alludes to that passage in the Old Testament. Even Isaiah talked about it. This is the beauty of this new system. Whom do we have to fear? Whom do we have to fear? God has justified us. We're right with the ultimate in the universe. We can't be put to shame. Verse 12, for, that explains, there's no difference. See, they had a big difference between Jew and Gent Gentile, Jew and Greek in the first century. But he said, with God, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon. Doesn't matter what race you are. Doesn't matter what you look like. None of that matters. This is a new system. It's not just for Israelites. This is for everyone. A beautiful system. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. Ephesians 1 verse 3, we have all spiritual blessings in Christ. All of them are available to us because we're in this new system. All spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1 Verse number 3. He is rich unto all that God. But now, look with me in verse 13. Here's the key passage to understanding all of these verses is verse 13. For, that means explanation. For. For what? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, I thought all you had to do was believe in the Lord. In verse 9. Well, that is one thing you have to do, but that's not all you have to do. And you can't take that one verse, Romans 10, 9, out of its setting. You've got to read all the verses. And verse 13 says you've got to call on Him. Now, which verse is right? Verse 9 or verse 13? <laughs> They're both right. They're both right. It's all the Word of God. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, think about this. From Romans 10, 9, people say, well, all that means all you've got to do is believe in Jesus. You're saved right then. All right, well, what about verse 13? Just a few verses down, in the same paragraph, what does it say? Here we find there's something else we have to do to be saved. Not just believe, not just trust in Jesus, not just accept Him as your Savior. There's something else you have to do. Verse 13. What do you have to do? You've got to call upon the name of the Lord. You have to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, i got a little pointer in here, but it's, it's one of those things like if you shine it in an airplane, it'll make them crash. So I don't use it because I'm afraid I'll make some airplane crash, so I just point at it. you got to call upon the name of the Lord. That's more than just believing. Think about this. It says you have to believe and confess. 
Confess is more than just believing, isn't it? So that means it's more than faith only in the verse they use. But now we learn we got to call on the name of the Lord. All right, here's my question. How does one call upon the name of the Lord? I used to believe that just means you get down on your knees and you say, Lord, I am a sinner. I accept your sacrifice. Save me from my sins. I call on you to save me. That's what I used to believe. Why don't we let the Bible answer it? Well, you think that'd be a little bit safer than what I think or what any preacher thinks? Why don't we just let the Bible answer it? What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Well, the first thing I want you to see, it doesn't mean just saying, Lord, save me. Lord, I accept you as my Savior. It does not mean that. How do I know that? Look at Matthew 7, 21. Jesus Christ Himself said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Jesus said, It's not enough to call Lord, Lord. You have to do something. That's in Matthew 7, 21. That's the words of Jesus. It's not enough to just say, Oh Lord, because Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then you don't do what I say? So I, I, you can do this right there. Calling on the name of the Lord doesn't just mean say, Lord, save me. Well, what does it mean? Well, let's let the Bible answer it. It's taken from Joel 2, verse number 32. That's what Paul is alluding to. Well, what does it mean when it's applied in the book of Romans to salvation? Acts 2.21 You remember the day the Holy Spirit came on the apostles. They spake in languages they had never studied. Tongues of fire set upon each one of them. And a multitude came together and they heard the first gospel sermon after the resurrection of Christ. And one of the things they said in this sermon is Acts 2.21. He told those folks, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There it is, Acts 2.21. So what did he tell these folks to do? Call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Right? Okay. Let's look at verse 36. Same chapter, Acts 2.36. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly God has made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, well, I already told you in verse 21, call on the name of the Lord. Isn't that what he said in verse 21? Isn't that what he said? Acts 2.21, call it, have I got it right, Red? Isn't it 2.21? Call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. He said that in Acts 2.21. So they asked him in 37, what do we got to do? He already told them in 21. They didn't understand what he meant by calling on the name of the Lord. Or they wouldn't ask this question. What is the question? Acts 2.37 When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They didn't understand what he meant in Acts 2.21 which comes from Joel 2.32. So Peter explained what he meant in verse 38. What shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Every 
one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now what? He told them in Acts 2.21, you've got to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. In Acts 2.36-38, he explained calling on the name of the Lord includes repentance and baptism. Who said it? H.D. Simmons? No, the Apostle Peter. Who cares what H.D. Simmons or any other preacher says? Here's what the Bible says. Here's what he told them. Acts 2, 36-38 explains what it means to call on the name of the Lord. Let me show you another one. Makes it even more clear to me. I hope it will for you. Acts 22, 16. You remember the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. He's on the road to Damascus. Bright light shines on him about noon. He falls to the ground. He says, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord says, go into the city and there you'll be told what you must do. Acts 9, 1, through follow, 1 and following. Go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Acts 22, 16, a preacher named Ananias came unto them, and this is what he told him to do. And now, why tarryest thou? Why do you delay? What are you waiting for? Arise. Be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord is aorist. So what it literally says is arise, be baptized, wash away your sins, having called on the name of the Lord. What does calling on the name of the Lord mean? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins having called on the name of the Lord. That's what calling on the name of the Lord means. Now that's in Romans 10, 13. That's explaining Romans 10, 9. Verse 14. How are they going to call on Him whom they have not believed? How are they going to believe on Him and whom they have not heard? How are they going to hear without a preacher? Somebody's got to tell it to them. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, Isaiah said, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. That's from Isaiah 52, verse 7. After the resurrection. We'll mess up an airplane here. So. After the resurrection, Jesus met with His closest followers. Look what He says. As I have been sent, so I send you. That's what Paul's talking about here. How should they preach except they be sent? Jesus sent them out. The miracles confirmed their message. Mark 16, 16 through 20. The Lord working with them, confirming the words with signs following. They went out and preached this word to all of the world. The Lord sent them out. John 20, 21. So people got to hear this wonderful new message. But look at verse 16. Unfortunately, they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? That's Isaiah 53, 1. A lot of people heard it, didn't obey it. A lot of people here today don't obey it. What chances would we have to teach an 87-year-old woman 
the gospel. And after all those years, she come up this building and be baptized. There she sits. She heard the gospel. She'd always tried to do right. But now she heard something a little bit different. And even though it went against everything she'd ever believed, she obeyed it. But look at all these people that didn't. Look at all the people now that don't. You see what Romans 10 is saying? You have to obey the Gospel. You can't just believe it. You have to read the whole paragraph, not just verse 9. Would you take a trigonometry book and turn to page 195, go down to the middle section, take out one sentence, read that sentence and say, I understood the book. You probably need to be put somewhere. That's the way we do the Bible. Take Romans 10, verse 9, out of its entire context and teach an entire doctrine on it. What a shame. So, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God. They were sent out to preach this beautiful message. That's how faith comes. God doesn't just give you faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. When you hear it and submit to it, you obey the Gospel. It is clear the Word of faith Paul preached must be obeyed. What do you have to obey? You have to hear God's Word. You have to believe it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. That's not enough just to believe it. You have to turn from your sins, Acts 2, 38. That's calling on the Lord. You have to confess your faith in Christ, Romans 10, 9. You have to be buried with Christ in baptism, Acts 22, 16. Then you've obeyed the Gospel then all of your sins are gone, taken away by the blood of Jesus. You have one more opportunity to do that right now.